everybody, and welcome to Basic Black. Some of you are joining us on our broadcast, and others of you are joining us on our digital platforms. I'm Crystal Haynes, your host. Tonight, stress and healing. According to the American Psychological Association's 2023 Stress in America report, the major stressors in Americans aged 45 to 64 range from money, the economy to health related issues. Stress affects both the body and the brain. It raises your cortisol levels, increases inflammation and elevates blood sugar. And for black and brown communities, stress has been shown to have an enormous impact on one's health due to health and education disparities, finances and even where you live. So this evening we are going to discuss how this stress impacts communities of color and the type of healing modality is available. Well, joining us tonight to discuss it, Dr. Cecil R. Webster Jr. is an adult, adolescent, and child psychiatrist and lecturer at McLean Hospital. Marlene Boyette is an educator at the Advent School and Yoga and Meditation Facilitator at JP Center Yoga. She's also the owner of Leela Yoga and Wellness. Dr. Zachary Hermes is an eternal medicine physician and fellow in cardiovascular medicine at Mass General Brigham, where he practices at Brigham's Watkins Cardiovascular Clinic. He's also the chief medical officer at Well With All, a health and wellness company centered on black health and wellness. And of course, we also have Dr. Lucy Lomas. She is an obstetrician gynecologist, a health community activist, an advocate, and the executive director of the New England Medical Association. Welcome to you all. Thank you so much for being with us here. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. So I would love to start with you, Dr. Uh, Lomas, or Lucy. May I call you Lucy? You may. All right, Lucy, <laughs> right? Um, so let's talk about the overall effect that stress has on especially folks in the black and brown community because we know that internal uh, internal racism uh, structural racism has a huge role to play absolutely so stress is a normal body response and your your brain and everything just um your stress is a stress is a normal body response mm -hmm. and your brain and your body functions the way it's designed when you when you encounter stress your blood pressure goes up your glucose levels may go up your heart may, your heart rate may be beating faster like mine is right now yeah. <laughs> and um, it even can cause GI issues mm -hmm. problems with digestion it impacts every single organ system mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Marlene, I know in your practice, uh, you know, as a trauma-informed yoga instructor, uh, I've actually been to one of your sound we healings. Sound yeah. at the Gardner Museum. That was amazing. And we know that stress is a ma huge factor in right. both your mind, your body, and your spirit yes. as well. Yes, it is. And, and so I think it shows up in a myriad of ways, right? Like, I think that folks may not even identify it as, as stress. I think it's something that's so common amongst us in day-to-day -day living, people of color, that we don't always pinpoint it as stress, but it can be anxiety, it can be short-temperedness, uh, insomnia, tension in various portions of the body. So it does show up in, in so many different ways. Yeah, and there's certainly lots of ways to, to impact it. I know cardiovascularly, though, a lot of the studies point to stress being the way that people are affected. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, I think what we know is stress, as we've heard, um, is a normal response. Mm. The issue becomes when we're continuously and chronically navigating stress. Mm -hmm. And the impact of that on our body and its ability to restore itself, to heal itself, to maintain itself, um, are kind of critically challenged. So there's this concept of, of biological weathering, aging, mm -hmm. um, this concept of you know, allostatic load. Again, our body responds to stress and bounces back. But with that continuous stress, we then start to see um, abnormal function as the body doesn't have that opportunity to recover, to restore. So that's where we see hypertension, mm. right? You can even think in the name, you know, hypertension. Um, you know, we see uh, diabetes, you know, inability to appropriately regulate uh, our blood sugar. You know, these are cardiometabolic conditions fundamentally that are deeply tied um, to stress. 
And I know that one thing that in some of the pre-interviews that we all spoke to, all of you all, especially in the medical profession, is that really changing your approach to think about the whole body, the whole person, the mind, and things like that um, are re is really important. So I wonder if you could talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in psychiatry, we often think of the brain as that connection between, you know, your neurons, like the the physical cellular level of our uh, of our functioning, and our mind, like uh, how we interpret our environment, what we think, what we see, what we feel, um, and you know, normal stress loads, like. We, that's an important thing. We go to the airport. We've got. We were talking about kids earlier. We've got our kids running around. It can be a really stressful time. Our cortisol goes up, and we have to manage that. Uh, but when it gets chronic, um, that's where it can really affect aspects of our brain and our mind. So cognitive difficulties, like ability to learn or remember or remember details or make decisions, like those higher level functioning uh, parts of our brain. Um, other things like uh, our ability to interpret information, like uh, understand what our environment is, uh, like how are we evaluating that? Is this, uh, is this airport a safe place or is this a place that I need to flee? And oftentimes when there's a lot of stress, um, those parts of our brains can get hijacked and uh, give us false information in some ways. Uh, one thing uh, you had mentioned, though, in the Black Lives Matter movement, that there was a lot of studies done in terms of the effect of stress of that time on black and brown folks. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I don't think it'll be any surprise, especially for people of color, but particularly for black people, uh, that that time has had some significant impact on our community as individuals as well. Um, there was a study actually back in 2018 um, on the effects of uh, the killing of unarmed uh, black Americans. And what they found was when there were black Americans that were killed, uh, unarmed black people that were killed, uh, mental health uh, difficulties increased in black Americans in that state or in adjacent states. Uh, and that effect lasted for a few months. There have been some other studies that have sort of supported and um, expanded on this idea. But I, I think it's pretty critical that we understand, that, you know, how something affects one person, in, in that case with Black Lives Matter movement, like the killing of unarmed individuals, mm -hmm. can really affect all of us, uh, because we can see ourselves in that. Um, interestingly, uh, in that same study, they found that white Americans were not affected by the killings in terms of mental health uh, uh, by the killings of uh, unarmed black Americans. Mm. That's so fascinating to me because taking into account that there is this disparity in effect on the body, on the mind. And I know, uh, Lucy, we, t we talked about in the pre-interviews about how when you walk into your doctor's office, whether it be your obstetrician's office, whether it be in your GP's office, doctors need to take that in, into account in terms of how their, their patients are showing up physically. Absolutely. Um, you know, when you walk into your doctor's office and you see somebody that looks like you and they have those shared life experiences, um, the patient is more likely to open up, be more honest and open about the challenges that they are experiencing in their body, in their home life, in their work life. And it means and it creates a more meaningful interaction and the patient gets way more out of it. Um, I know when we are talking about, you know, the cardiovascular system, black and brown folks, they're, you know, a lot of times they point to the diet and, and things like that, but not stress. When you see patients, I'm thoughtful about, I imagine you have a different lens on it, but when your colleagues see patients, do they think about stress as an additional layer to a poor outcome? I think, unfortunately, it's a, a deeply under-recognized and under-appreciated um, context for all of disease mm -hmm. and illness. I think, as you said, specifically cardiovascular disease, it's so critical. And one of the things I didn't mention and, and isn't discussed enough, when we think about heart attacks, for instance, mm -hmm. um, what we know is that traditional risk factors, high blood pressure, um, you know, abnormal uh, cholesterol, um, weight, really explain maybe 60% of those cases. There's mm. a big gap that we still today can't explain. There's another body of literature that does success. Psychological distress, stress is at the root cause of that. So it's a, it's a real disservice 
and on, you know, transparently that is happening is we don't center people's lived experience and particularly again for our community, um, the layers of stress that we navigate, as you said. Um, so when I see a patient, my first, you know, conversation is help me understand who you are, mm -hmm. right? Help me understand your journey, what has brought you here. And that includes, um, you know, what is your housing like? You know, what is, you know, your access and, you know, experience with uh, what you put in your body, um, your employment and your finances. Not only financial strain, which we know is a stressful factor, um, but the navigation of a workplace. I think this is, you know, a reality that we all know. Um, small t traumas um, are encountered. Uh, you know, Lucy and, and Nima actually have a, a brilliant um, white coat trauma um, program mm. that speaks to, again, the stresses that even as a, as a black healthcare provider you face in a hospital, be it, um, you know, disrespect from nurses, you know, patients um, who might be assuming, though you come in with a white coat, that you're a transport. Yeah. Uh, and what we know is that, you know, these um, stressors, also, you know, occur in corporate environments. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the reality is that wherever we are on the socioeconomic strata, we're still encountering um, these stressors. So as I see someone, um, I need to understand, you know, what is life like before we start talking about blood pressure, blood sugar, yeah, absolutely. It's certainly more worth more than, you know, maybe the 10 or 15 minutes you probably have to engage your your uh, provider there. Marlene, we talked about trauma informed uh, care and and programs. I mean, I, when I first was reading up about this, I didn't know that trauma informed yoga was a thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. Talk to me about that. Sure. So. Uh, I came into trauma-informed yoga through a studio here in Boston, uh, Four Corners Yoga and Wellness. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time actually in 2016 that I had heard of it at all and was very curious about it then. And so uh, it the approach with trauma-informed is the understanding that human beings in general as existing on this planet, right, will encounter various levels of trauma just as existing. Um, for me, as a facilitator, uh, my interpretation and, like, the way that I have formulated this to my own teaching is to also observe many of the things that you spoke about, the way that people of color are encountering um, mm -hmm. trauma in their day-to-day -day life, whether it's racial trauma, economic trauma, uh, housing, uh, food, you know, all of these things that are part of how we experience the world and differently from white bodied people. And so when I'm teaching, I'm taking all of these things into, into consideration, excuse me, and then inviting people to come back into their bodies mm -hmm. because these traumas separate us from our, our bodies, right? They separate you from experiencing things to even acknowledge that what you are going through is trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and to notice your breath, which we're also very separated from, like our, uh, even acknowledging a, a breathing pattern for many people who are in a constant state of stress where you're binding your breath, right? Even just coming back to your natural rhythm can be incredibly challenging. Mm -hmm. So the practice of trauma-informed yoga is to welcome people to come back to their breath, to welcome people to come back to their bodies, to uh, gradually acknowledge the various things that they're feeling, whether it's tension in the various portions of their body or pain, um, and then begin to figure out what works for them in terms of movement or stillness. Mm. You know, we know that African Americans are more likely to experience socioeconomic disparities like exclusion from health, educational, and socioeconomic resources. You know, experts say that these disparities contribute to worse mental health outcomes. And in fact, actually dropped in on a yoga class through Four Corners Yoga and Wellness in Dorchester, where they really aim to use proact this as a proactive tool for healing. I really do believe that our bodies keep the score over time and our experiences start to sit in our bodies. And over time, it's detrimental to our nervous system. For decades, research has shown that chronic stress from racism in neighborhood conditions is toxic to black and brown people. Everything from the cardiovascular system to mental health is affected. 
In Rosie DeCanto's Yin class in Dorchester, these students are working to change those outcomes through yoga and meditation. Four Corners is a black-owned yoga and wellness organization aimed at expanding access to the practice and creating spaces for equity conversations. For me, my first yoga teacher was black. So that felt good, and that gave me permission, like, hey, this is for me. I think yoga can really be the tool our medicine, our community needs to thrive and grow and heal. I joined one of Rosie's classes at Conman Square Neighborhood Health Center's Great Hall and instantly felt a connection to community. Little uncomfortable. If not a little bit out of my comfort zone. We see some folks and how they age and how they live these long, healthy lives. That's for us, too. Student and yoga instructor Isla Gavin says she began to pay attention to the stress she was carrying from work. And then when she saw more and more older black women in her community raising their grandchildren. All that is going to increase your capacity to be, number one, and then number two, to be in community um, including your family. Mm. That's probably the biggest gift, right, that we can give. Own peace. May there be peace in your body, in your mind, and in your soul. Thank you for coming. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I noticed or, or was this idea of, like, you choose your practice, what you need in that moment. That was a yin class. So we just stayed in positions longer, and mm -hmm. you could feel, you know, the stress right. sort of melt away. Mm -hmm. One thing I think was really important to hear was that it's okay if you take this time to rest. Yes. Yeah. The way that I approach teaching is invitation rather than directive. Mm -hmm. And I think because we, again, as people of color, are constantly in spaces where people are telling us what to do and telling us how to move and how to feel. And so allowing people the opportunity to move as they feel comfortable or to be as still as they need to, I think is just important. Sometimes people just need to rest. And I don't think there's enough space and opportunity for that for us, you know, people of color. And being able to come to a movement class and someone tell you that it's okay if you skip this, you know, what I'm offering and just put yourself in a, pos a position where you can rest, I think can be you know, empowering for people. The autonomy and the practice is really important. Mm. Cecil, I want to ask you about using these modalities like yoga, like uh, sound bath and meditation as, as a way to sort of treat patients, but also help the community at large lower that stress level that seems to be at a constant hum, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's so vitally important that people understand the many ways in which they can uh, rest. I, I think that was a word used. I think it's very important. Um, a part of that is also understanding, like understanding what's happening in your environment. And a part of that has to do very much with community. So if you can be in your body, noticing your body, your stress, uh, have a little more control over how your body reacts to your environment and have a community that can say like, yeah, like uh, that, that, that was pretty racist. Or like, yes, I'm really stressed out. My, uh, my black son has got his driver's license and we're, and we're worried about him. Um, I think there's a really important way uh, that we can um, make sure that we understand what the, what the environment might be, like that we don't have to worry about those sorts of things alone. Um, and that we have somebody at least to say like, yeah, like uh, th this, is, th this is not an ideal situation and it's based on history and it doesn't have much to do with you. Yeah. Is it something that you would prescribe to your patients, maybe yoga or meditation, that kind of thing? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. As we think about the holistic context of cardiovascular disease, um, integrating these non-pharmacologic you know, components are so critical. And again, as a, as a field, we do a disservice in educating and, and explicitly recommending this to our patients. And as a result, people don't always appreciate these are evidence-based approaches um, that are also very empowering. Um, so that you know, balance of you know, finding modalities that help you modulate your response to stress, because I think that's another big point. Again, we encounter stress, but where it becomes toxic is how we respond to that stress. Um, and understanding that there are ways that we can start to develop tools and control over that is, is really critical. Similarly, um, what we eat, right? 
We don't think about how ultra processed food, that's a stressor for our body. As our body's absorbing and trying to, to process that, it's, it's stressful. So being mindful about what we're putting in our body. Um, movement, right, I think as, as we've said, um, is powerful, but even just walking. Right. Mm -hmm. If you can, if you can find a space that's, you know, relaxing, walking for 20 minutes, um, that's a de-stressing, you know, uh, process and experience. So, I always try to bring that framework of we have our medicines, um, but you know, we need to think about how we're identifying stress um, because many of us don't think we're, you know, experiencing stress. We got it. You know, we're we're we're, mm -hmm. we're making it happen, mm -hmm. um, but understanding that again, that implicit stress is is almost always there. So modulating what we're putting in our body and movement. And Lucy, we talked about Nima's um, trauma team and, and, and program there to, to deal with stress. Is these alternative modalities sort of part of that? Absolutely. So um, Nima has this um, meeting and it's called White Coat Trauma and Racism. And basically it allows the black physicians to acknowledge the microaggressions that we have experienced within the healthcare system. Yeah. Um, and what I have acknowledged is that I can share the tools that I have learned in this group with my patients. Um, acknowledging that a holistic approach to their health and well-being is actually really good. And when, when we give our patients the opportunity to reflect and identify, hey, what, work, what works for you? What kind of embodiment exercises, whether that be yoga, whether that be walking, whether that be exercising or going for a run, what works for you? What foods are working for you and, how, and help you feel better? And I think just giving people the opportunity to um, be empowered, understand how the brain and body works, and be reflective so that they can just gradually make those small changes can really make a really big impact. Yeah, and, and Marlene, I know that... Um you were working with Four Corners Yoga. You started there. You started talked about that. But I think what I thought was really interesting was the quote from Ayla who said, you know, growing old and being healthy in that older age is for us. Mm -hmm. And that really, that really stuck with me. Yeah. I think that so many of these modalities, we don't associate, we don't connect with them because we don't think they're for us, mm -hmm. right? I think that the way that wellness has been like commercialized in this country right mm. in the western world is like it doesn't show us right it doesn't represent us and so reminding folks like foundationally that these practices actually were developed by brown people right that yoga comes from uh india and also from kemet from egypt that there are these are historic practices that do belong to us and and that we are deserving of that it's not something to be earned and i think if we think about how our ancestors were were in touch and connected to land and movement like every day and getting outside and being within the sun and getting our food from the earth and you know, just moving right like in in very natural ways uh, if we could return to that in some way, right? Not, not always, because that's not, it's not realistic, right? But if we can get, grasp some of that and, and keep some of those jewels, like, we, that, there's healing in that. Yeah. I, I want to uh, actually um, sure. double tap on one of that point. Again, longevity, aging mm -hmm. um, with wellness and health is for us. You know, we rightfully... Um, focus on the disparities and inequities that we find, but there are untold stories, right? What black resilience, one of our most esteemed cardiologists, Herman Taylor, who's now based in Atlanta, um, has really been the leading proponent of, again, highlighting across the South, across the U.S., there are pockets of elders, you know, sanitarians, nonagenarians. Many of us know them in our families, and these are people who grew up in, you know, Jim Crow, apartheid, um, segregation, but they've thrived. Um, so what we need to understand is, is what, what, what is it about, you know, the way they lived that allowed them to navigate all this trauma and stress? And it's exactly many of the, many of the things we just reflected on. Yeah, and, and I know that there are a bunch of resources, books that are out there, and of course, uh, you know, each one of your organizations provide those resources as well. Um, in our last uh, 30 seconds, I do want to 
ask you, Marlene, to give folks a quick, you know, sort of check in. Like what, what, what's one thing they can do to check in with themselves? I think taking a moment, even if it's just at the start of your day, right, to check in with yourself. And I do this often with people who come into the studio to practice with me, like to just ask yourself, like, how am I feeling before you start to give your attention to everything else, like to check in, acknowledge how your body is feeling, acknowledge the state that your heart is in um, and what you might need for that day. Mm -hmm. That's a mindfulness practice. Yeah. Right. And that's something that can be done every day. Yeah. yeah. And we're going to continue this conversation. But that is the end of our broadcast and the end of our show. Thank you so much to all of our guests and thank you for watching. Now stay with us as we continue to talk about this issue on our digital platforms, YouTube and Facebook. Hi, everybody. I'm Crystal Haynes, your host. We are on YouTube and Facebook with our post show, continuing our conversation on stress and healing. And Marlene, you know, we ended our broadcast and talking about what you guide folks into or, or allow them into themselves. What do you say in terms of allowing them to ground themselves and sort of start to heal some of that sure. stress? I think something that I mentioned is um, that I invite folks into things. So it's, I'm not mm -hmm. telling them what to do or what to feel or how to breathe, but I'm inviting them to move through the practice in ways that feel good to them, to take breaks as they feel they need to. Um, I encourage them to try to connect with their natural breath, to acknowledge the things that are crossing their mind, um, how their physical body is feeling. Uh, and also acknowledging like, if any of the emotions that they're carrying with them are things that they've cultivated or things that are like exterior, mm -hmm. right? Like, did you cultivate this feeling for yourself or is this the result of something that's been projected onto you or something that's landed on you by way of someone else? And I don't think that's something that people really think about, right? Mm -hmm. But just having a moment to process that, like, why do, why do I feel like this? Why am I experiencing this tension in my body? And giving themselves permission to kind of move through it, you know, breathe through it. Yeah. And Cecil, you were, you, you, you were like, yes, that's <laughs> it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You, you mentioned a word, actually, projection, uh, which uh, is a psychoanalytic term, uh, where basically a person can disavow like, part, like negative parts of themselves and place it into somebody else. Um, racism is a really great example of a system of uh, projection, mm -hmm. and it, it's it's made its way into a um, you know like a like just cultural. It's a cultural mm -hmm. word now, uh, which I appreciate, and I, I think it's so important to help people understand. Like, okay, you you have stress, uh, your your body is tight, and that's not necessarily yours. I see a lot of kids. I see adults in um, like various forms of like practice of uh, uh, whatever careers that they might have. But I find it to be very helpful to help people understand that this is not necessarily theirs. Mm -hmm. Like they don't have to bear the burden of um, those like uh, hostilities in the same way. Um, granted, we're in many ways responsible for those hostilities and that racism. Um, like we have to navigate them. But we need to do that with other people, have people help us understand it, identify it, and know that it's not necessarily ours. Yeah. And, and I know um, Dr. Lomas or Lucy, we've, we've, we're already on a first name basis. I know that, you know, especially in your practice, we, we talked about the cardiovascular work that's being done, but also it can have other effects like fertility, like things like that where stress affects all of that. 
Absolutely. And, you know, what's interesting, like we had mentioned before, stress is a normal bodily process mm -hmm. where a little bit is good. It mm -hmm. improves performance. It improves our productivity. But over time, our body starts to wear down mm -hmm. and it does not function as well. So it absolutely can impact fertility. It absolutely can cause chronic migraines. It mm -hmm. can in, impact your cardiovascular system. Um, so all of those things play a big part into how our body responds to stress. And Cecil brought up a good point about we don't have to carry the burdens that we in, that we mm. that we have that has been, that have been projected onto us. And doing some of that healing in community is also really important. So whether that is going to a yoga class. Um, one of the things that I have been involved with is creating these groups so that we can actually talk about our bodies, understand how our brains and bodies work, acknowledge that a lot of people are experiencing some of the same things, and we can also learn and heal and recover in community, in, in groups. And I think that's also something that we need to just continue to do more of. Yeah. Absolutely. And having a, a physician, a yoga instructor that looks like you helps in both a medical space and then also in a, a healing space as well. Because I remember going into the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, into your, your sound bath, being like, is this is this where I should be at right now? <laughs> like, And then you came out and I was like, oh, yeah, this is it. Yeah. I think it's important. I think we, in all areas of life, we need to see ourselves, right? And yeah. I think... From the littlest person, like the you know the youngest child to the the, the oldest elder, um, being able to recognize yourself in a space with within another person is valuable for your mental health, your emotional health, um, and a sense of of welcomeness. I. I I'm always very careful to speak about like creating safe space because I cannot dictate whether a space feels safe to another person, mm -hmm. but. I try to make sure that the space is welcoming and, you know, I, I facilitate a BIPOC-only wellness space at JP Center and the goal within that space is to welcome people of color to practice and see people who look like them in, in community, as, as Lucy mentioned. And I think, like, we need our villages mm. and we need to come back to that um, you know, these practices and, and being in community are, are healing and can be very supportive to the practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Zachary, how do you engage your colleagues about creating that safe space? Because a lot of times people, when they go to a doctor, yeah. they're probably at one of their most vulnerable points in Absolutely. their life. Yeah. Yeah, I think just to, to before I address that, yeah. you know, this idea of the importance of what we call racial concordance, mm -hmm. right, between provider and patient. Um, obviously, it's not always possible, um, but we do know when it is present, it improves communication, it improves trust, it even improves kind of the translation of what's being recommended or the, the, the plan that's being set out. So, again, just that opportunity to share lived experiences is, is so critical. And as we think about how we engage, you know, the broader field of, of healthcare providers to understand um, why there's mistrust, um, to understand, you know, how our lived experiences um, inform our interactions with our patients, uh, it's a challenge, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's the honest answer. Um, you know, we have you know cultural competency trainings. Um, you know, we bring in um, different speakers to share data evidence um, that really clarifies um, the just factual reality. Um, but the honest answer is it doesn't always get integrated. Um, the honest answer is that a, a lot of people don't always appreciate it as a priority. Mm -hmm. So one of my, my personal um, you know, beliefs is the importance of these complementary healing spaces um, where we can move health and healing outside of the you know, traditional corridors of hospitals and clinics um, and into spaces where people feel more empowered. Um, people feel that you know, it's a, a horizontal interaction and obviously it's incumbent on us as providers um, to, to show up in those spaces as well. Mm -hmm. two, two quick things I actually sure. just wanted to share, um, kind of very concrete practices uh, I encourage folks to, uh, to think about. We, and it just uh, provides maybe some framework we use a PIES check-in, called PIES check-in. And it just is a simple way, right? Physical, 
Um, where's the tension in your body? Intellectual. What's on your mind? Um, how are you thinking? Emotional. How are you feeling? Um, and then spiritual. And I think you know, that's a common thread that we've been hinting at. But, but spirituality is such a critical element as well of resilience um, in our overcoming and navigating of stress. I think the, the, the final piece is belly breathing, right? So just that simple balloon breathing. You blow out your belly to four, hold, and blow it out to six. And, and this is, again, really a scientific and evidence-based. As you're breathing with your belly, you engage your diaphragm. To engage your diaphragm, you have to engage your vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve kind of counters that fight or flight response. So mm -hmm. belly breathing, as simple as it sounds sometimes, as silly as it sounds, is a really powerful and, and evidence-based way to, to bring down the temperature and the stress. Yeah. And Cecil, so, you know, in, especially in your field, black and brown folks tend to be like, you know, I'm either going to go to church or I'm going to figure it out. And, and I'm not going to ask for the help because we do know that depression and things like that do fall uh, along racial lines and in socioeconomic lines as well. Absolutely. I, I, I will say that in psychiatry particularly, we're trying to do a much better job about um, being more visible, allowing people to see more of us. Um, it, to lower some of those barriers, um, oftentimes people, like there, is, uh, there are some studies that show that people have a higher degree of satisfaction when they have a provider that looks like them, as, as an example. But it, it, it can't end right there. There are lots of identities that intersect with like uh, being a person of color that we might not be able to see. Uh, people's sexuality mm. or their disability or many other things. Um, so once they're in the door or once they're able to um, imagine like, okay, this might be a space for me, just like the Isabella Stewart, uh, Stewart Gardner Museum, um, we still have to look for who these people are. Tell me about your life. Tell me about your spouse. Tell me about your kids, which we've done a lot of talking about earlier today. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, uh, certainly we could talk about this all day long, right? Uh, but we will have to end it right here. What an in great, uh, amazing discussion. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us here. I am Crystal Haynes. Everybody have a great night and take care of each other.